All right, I would like to uh, start and welcome you, uh, Jeroen. Thank you very much for uh, being here today. Um, so I will give a, a short introduction about Jeroen, even though I, I don't think actually I need, I need my notes, but, but who knows, maybe I forget something. So Jeroen is now a professor at the um, Department of Developmental Bioengineering in, uh, in the University of Twente, uh, where he's leading a group on the use of microtechnologies um, to aid molecular and cellular research in the field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. This is actually, this is how I summarized your work, which I think is, I think is pretty close. So Jeroen has a, a master in biomedical sciences in, uh, in, in Leiden. Um, and then he moved to, to the University of Twente, where he did his PhD, and that's also where we met. I was actually in his um, PhD um, committee, or at least I was listening to the presentation when you applied for the PhD position uh, back in the days. And then uh, you were hired, uh, working with uh, Master Kamperin and Clemens van Blitterswijk. Um, and after the PhD, um, uh, Jeroen went on to, uh, to Leuven first, uh, to do a postdoc, and then later at uh, the Wies Institute in, uh, in Boston. Um, and after that, he moved back to, to the Netherlands, actually moved back to, to Twente to become uh, uh, an assistant professor, and now, in the meantime, become a full professor. Um, that's also reflected by some of the, some of his, uh, um, the things that he achieved. So, uh, a VNE grant, a VD grant, an ERC starting grant. Uh, Jeroen is the member of the uh, of the Young Academy. Uh, he's also a board member of the Netherlands Society for Biomaterials and Tissue Engineering. Um, and with his work, he's won numerous prizes. Um, and that is actually because he's doing very innovative research at the interface between microfabrication, material engineering, and, uh, and cell biology. So we're very happy to have you here today, Jeroen, and we're uh, very interested to learn what you have done. So now we have to do a little switch. If you put that in your pockets. Ja, die andere moet je ook laten zitten. Ja, een button. Yep. The, this one goes here. And then like this. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, thanks Jan for the kind introduction. <coughs> so, if nothing else, at least the slides uh, probably you'll find them very colorful. So, <laughs> um, that is one thing. Um, and before I actually dive into that, what those colors mean and what the science behind it means, I actually want to start talking about some basic concepts where actually this whole research line comes from. And let's start with something we all understand and really love. At least you can see with me, I really love cookies. It's, uh, I need to support a bit more. <coughs> but if you look at these type of cookies, you would say these are very different. But yet, if you ask a specific uh, uh, scientist, you would actually blend this up and for example, put this in a moss pack it would come back that these two cookies are fully identical. Now, if I blindfold you and I let you eat them intact, you will be very convinced that these two cookies are different. That means that despite the chemical information in a system, actual spatial structuring, modularity, creates information that our biological system can deal with. So, in this case, we have a cookie, we have chocolate. These materials differ in material properties. And if you actually melt the chocolate into the cookie, make it into a homogeneous construct, you lose this information. In other words, next time if you go to the supermarket, don't think yummy, think smart, functional, spatially organized condiment. Now, why was this so important? Before the chocolate chip cookie, which is now on three different continents, the number one selling uh, cookie, it was, you would take some flour, some eggs, some sugar, you add either butter or oil, if you, uh, on your own pr uh, preference, and then you make a homogeneous construct, dough. You add your secret ingredient, pop it in the oven, and there you go, your construct. Now, for tissue engineering, we basically do the same thing. Actually, we don't just use polymers, cells, matrix, growth factors. We create an homogeneous construct. This time it's not dough, it is a cell-laden hydrogel, for example, we add our secret ingredient, pop it in our, uh, in our oven, an incubator, and there you go, you get a tissue construct. Now, most of the tissues that we're creating still are made this way, meaning 
we create, at least at the moment of, of its uh, inception of engineering, these tissues are homogeneous. If you then look at the natural counterpart, none of our tissues are homogeneous, zero. For example, if you take a tissue that we work quite a lot with, for example cartilage, if you open up a te textbook that we give to bachelors, and yes, that textbook is wrong, because it will erroneously state that cartilage is a single type of uh, cell in a single type of matrix. Now, if you look at a histological section very zoomed <coughs> out, you can appreciate that that indeed seems to be the case. S cells dispersed in a bed of matrix, but even if you use a more high-powered magnification, you can already see this is not homogeneous whatsoever. There's modularity in the system. And if you even zoom in further and you use, for example, a TEM, a transmission electron microscope, then you can see that it's actually a cell in a pericellular domain with an extracellular matrix, a uh, territorial matrix around it. That means that even the simplest of tissues have this kind of information. And this information matters because, for example, if you look at the chondrocytes and you do an AFM mapping of this piece of tissue, you'll see that it's a cell in a very soft domain that is embedded in a very hard extracellular domain. Now, let's say we engineer a tissue <coughs> and you put your cell in a very soft domain. It's possible, but then you need extremely long times in order to mature your tissue. That is very costly. You need years of physiotherapy in order to treat these patients, if you even get it into the clinic uh, to start with, because the efficiency is very low and also the cost efficiency is even lower than that. On the other hand, we could say, okay, cartilage is about mm, half to two megapascals, so let's just engineer a gel. Well, we can do that with that stiffness. But then if you put your cells in, they start to create fibrocartilage because the stiffness is not correct. In other sense, this is a very simple example that you would like to have a modularity where your cell is in a uh, soft domain. Well, actually at the tissue level, it's hard. So you need paradoxical properties. It needs to be hard at the tissue level, but soft at the cellular level. And you can do that via modularity or functional complexity. And now I've just been talking about the mechanical properties, but the same is true for the biochemical properties. For example, if you talk about what do we need to create, for example, cartilage, the answer is use TGF beta. You pop it in, fully loaded with TGF beta, super physiological levels, what do you get? A lot of side effects because they leak out of this uh, construct and they start interacting with the tissues around it. Now, the reason why you do have these levels in your system but it doesn't create side effects is because it's only really around the cell, in the pericellular domain. Now, this is an example for cartilage, but name one tissue and I can give you other examples where such a modular structure is applicable. So, that's what I wanted to do <laughs> about a decade ago. So I wanted to uh, recreate this structure and the goal was to actually start to create some model modular designs instead of homogeneous designs. Now, we needed to then uh, use technology in order to do that because I can't pipe it about a picoliter droplet. So you need some uh, tricks and fluidics, microfluidics in specifically. And then typically we started with just water and oil, like you make a vinaigrette, but then in a uh, microfluidic device, so your droplets are very controllably produced. Now, this technology was already available when we entered the field. Very typically, these were 100 micrometer droplets. You place an individual cells in, and then if you actually start to calculate, can we use that for bioengineering? If you use the conventional 100 micrometer droplet, you get to about 80,000, 100,000 cells per cubic centimeter. That's way too low. You need about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th to get anywhere, and that is still sub-physiological for most tissues. So we needed to downscale the thickness of that coating. That sounds trivial, going from 100 to about, let's say, 40 micrometers, but you have to realize that means you still have to encapsulate a cell but only with 0.00001% of its volume, because this scales to the power of three. So we need to do the same trick, but with a ten thousandth of a percent. Now, then we basically calculated how big these cells would be, and then we started trying very naively to actually create this. Now, just for a back, uh, background, the polymers we typically use in most of the presentation 
It is a backbone, typically dextrin, but we are agnostic about which material we use. It varies from application to application. And typically we put tyramines on there. And these tyramines, if you conjugate them, then in the presence of uh, cytocompatible levels of hydrogen peroxide and HRP, or you can do rutidium and light cross-linking, or you can do metal complexation, if you will, then you can create a hydrogel out of this. Now, if you are wondering, can we do this with other materials? I'll not talk about it in this presentation, but we can do anything from ionic to light induced to supermolecular complexation, etc., etc. So I'll not spend so much more about the uh, <coughs> biomaterials, but most of what you'll see is this working horse material. Now, if you then actually start to use that material where you have your polymer stream, you put your cross linkers in there, you co-flow it with oil, you get your droplets with your cells in, then here's a funny trick. Curvature is actually adhesive, which means now you downscale your droplet and automatically all your cells are at the edge of your droplets. If you then start cross-linking them into a hydrogel, you can do that, but basically they will pop out. They will be squeezed out due to anisotropy in the mechanical forces and basically you lose your cells. Now, very quickly, that means you don't have cells in a gel, you actually have a cell that popped out of a gel, so not stable at all. So we spent about two and a half years trying to figure out how to do that. We did a lot of interesting science which all failed. And then we had actually a crisis meeting with the PhD student on this topic. And we were actually having lunch, and I kid you not, we were having lunch in a good restaurant where they served eggs. Now what we noticed is that all of our eggs were perfectly centered, which means you can have a liquid system where you have the particle centered perfectly within a water droplet, because egg yolk, egg whites, it's a liquid system till you boil it. So then we thought, okay, so how do they do this? So kitchen not, we went into the kitchen, we asked the chef, how do you do this? And he says, very simple, you need to stir it. Okay, fine, sorry. <laughs> so we go back to the lab, we actually make a device that stirs it. So after about five high-tech approaches, we now have an equivalent of an egg stirrer, and this works very nicely. So basically what we do is we generate our micro droplets with the cells in it, then we have a delay channel, and now what we do is uh, hydrogen peroxide goes through PDMS, goes through oil, diffuses into an aqueous phase. Inefficiently, but very effectively. So we built this system, and now what we can do is we can, instead of having like after 10 milliseconds a gelation occur, we can now have it after seconds to a minute. And then we demonstrated that if you do this, then after about 25 seconds of this kind of rolling like with the X, you now you can center your particle inside of the hydrogel. Now you can have a very nice nucleus cell in a microgel, completely conformal in all three dimensions, and then you see that it actually stays in a microgel. So now for the first time in history, we had a system where you can put a, a cell in a thin shell microgel that actually stayed in the microgel more than, let's say, one day, one and a half days. Now, you can see that not everything is in, and the reason why is some cells are bigger than the droplets we put in because we need to have a cutoff. So we can make them bigger, but then you lose your volume again. So we just took the 5% on the chin and ignore it. Now, we also saw that only 30% of our cells came out, which was weird because if we looked at the competition, two other labs in the world were trying to do this as well, and they had about 70 to 80% of the cells egressing, and we had the maximum of 30%. So then we realized our material is weird, it does something that the other two labs don't. We already have something that prevents the cell loss, the cell regression. So then we started to look at how this material actually works in a different way, because the cross-linking is tyrosine, uh, tyramine binds to tyramine, so it's an uh, enzymatic oxidative uh, uh, reaction where you create a polyphenol. But the cell also has phenolic compounds that are analogs of uh, tyramines, and those are tyrosins, which is an amino acid which is basically present in all of your cell proteins, on your cell membrane, in your cell uh, uh, proteins. And now we saw in a mass spec that indeed our material directly reacts with your cell. So we're not putting a cell in a gel, we're reacting the material onto your cell membrane, which is different than, than passively putting it in and hoping that you get an RGD a reaction with your integrin. So this is a covalent bond rather than an indirect uh, in non-covalent bond. We showed that we can use this for very nice cell painting, which sometimes we do, so you can actually covalently tether a fluorophore to your cell so it, it's not lost, very nice. 
And then also we work together with a group in Utrecht and I'm just showing this picture to show off because I think this is absolutely beautiful. This is not TEM, this is SEM. So we actually did a 4D scanning and then basically what you would see here is a cell with all the organelles that we can quantify but more importantly <coughs> you can see here that the cell is really interacting with these polymer strands. It's really pulling out these polymer strands. And again, otherwise than the tarimin, this is a bio-inert gel. Dextrin is an inert sugar. So this must be bonded in one way or another and together with the mass spec we should know how this works. That also means that although we don't have any binding ligands in the conventional sense, we ask the question, can we use this for mechanotransduction? So without RGDs or cadherins or anything, can we steer cell fate using just this material, which it theoretically shouldn't. We are able to make, by co-flowing this hydrogen peroxide in the co-channels very uh, controllably, so we can tune the stiffness in a linear manner. That means that we can now make soft to stiff in the sense of about 4 kilopascal to up to 50. Nowadays we do 120 kilopascals, so we cover the normal physiological range for mesenchymal tissues. And then basically you can do a differentiation, uh, in these uh, gels so you can keep them alive for we went to three months and after that we don't see the point anymore in the lab but they are remain uh, very nicely metabolically alive and uh, uh, sensible to growth factors and the nice thing because these uh, single cell microgels are so tiny you can use conventional equipment for example a normal fluorescence microscope to actually analyze everything at the single cell uh, level Normally you have to do this in confocal and then you have diffusion issues and light loss, etc. But now we can very nicely in high throughput see what is happening on the individual cell level. So we don't just see if stiffness happens, we can also do population analysis now. So for example, it won't surprise you that in a soft matrix you don't get uh, osteogenesis, but in a stiff matrix you actually get osteogenesis, which it should. But we also can now start looking at population variations, how many cells are actually how intensively depositing matrix or expressing growth factors or anything of that sort. More importantly, we can also do post cures, which allows us to answer a question that is uh, even more interesting for our lab, and that is not if stiffness matters, but when stiffness matters, because we really don't know. We know that it matters, but should it be in the beginning, in the end? And that is very important because if you think about changes in your tissue, your tissue has not one stiffness. Over time, aging for example, the stiffness changes. If you have acute trauma, stiffness changes. So these are the type of questions that we're starting to ask. And in this case, I just want to show that if we stiffen our gels, we did a whole bunch of assays, but we can't find any difference then immediately made stiff. So we can now wait a week, make it stiff, and it's identical if it came stiff out of the microfluidic device. Now, that means we have our controls in place and now we can start doing stiffening. So if we only have one day soft, you can already see that hardly there's any osteogenesis. If you have it for three days soft, and it doesn't matter how long we run this assay, we ad added a whole month to compensate for the three days, no osteogenesis. You cannot commit to the osteogenic lineage if you first had your first part of your differentiation in soft. Now, we don't understand that because most of the osteogenic markers actually don't come up in the first three days. So if you look at conventional molecular biology, it starts to happen around, let's say, five, seven days that you see something truly happening. So we also did some uh, RNA-seq and now we have a slight understanding. And in the paper we say we have a very good understanding, but in reality we have a very good tentative understanding of uh, how this differentiation now occurs, because this is the, the programming of cell fate before the canonical differentiation actually occurs. And this is committing. So we also wanted to know how this is mediated. So then we took our uh, uh, stem cells, we used our tyramin, but now we put a linker on there, a biotin, which you can pull out. So we labeled our cells with tyramins, we shredded the cells, pulled out the biotin. So now everything that is coupled to our tyramin, we now know where it's bonding to. And then the question is, so how is this mechanotransduction mediated? So we compared that with the meta atosome, which we scraped from literature, compiled it, so we now have something that this is all literature known for the uh, uh, adhesome from the cell, and compared it to what we found. Now you can already see that there's a very strong enrichment in actually uh, elements that are used uh, in the adhesome. It's a very small fraction, but we have 71 specific hits and only 24 aspecific hits. So that is a very, very strong enrichment. And if we then look at what type of molecules there are, there's a lot of fibronectins. 
we, it's uh, not that strange because also if you look at fibronectin, it has the highest amount of tyrosins available. So it, the more tyrosins you have, the more we find it back. So in this case, basically what we then do is if you match all these molecules on top of the pathways, we also identify that it goes via alpha-5 beta-1. So we also now know the uh, pull-down pathway where this is actually going via. And this is partially the same as integrin, but also partially different. So for example, this is YAPTAS independent. So we do mechanotransduction, YAPTAS will never be involved. This is one slide because <laughs> it was just accepted yesterday, so I was very happy to put it in. It's not the most complete slide, but then we also wanted to see, I've just been talking about cells and gels, right? But our lab also works a lot with uh, cellular uh, spheroids, organoids, and, uh, like bimaterial free entities which is amazing because you can get very nice <coughs> tissue structure because there's no biomaterial truly in the way of this, but also you don't have any instructive forces other than, for example, what you put in your media. So it's very inefficient. So we were wondering, could we make a combination of these worlds? And for example, if you make microaggregates of MSCs and very tiny ones, not the bigger ones, they are notoriously difficult to differentiate into the osteogenic lineage. You really have to wait a long term, if it happens at all, depending on your donor. So what we did is we made a cell-sized microgel that we made adhesive. We put it together with cells, then they fully autonomously self-assemble in microwells. So the cells actually drag the microgels with them. They form very nice uh, composite living microstructures, as we call them. And now we can also, again, start playing with the stiffness of these microgels. So now you have a mostly cellular tissue with very high cell-cell contact, which is absolutely different than if you put a cell in a gel. And then basically we start to do the differentiation. And you can very clearly see, well, if you, uh, if you don't have the microgels, you get almost no differentiation. If you have soft microgels, you get no differentiation. And if you now have stiff microgels, you have very potent differentiation. Now, we also did this in temporal control. So now we can also, for example, take an IPSC, do the IMC differentiation in a very soft manner as you would need, and then we can switch it to an osteogenic uh, lineage with a much stiffer. So we can also do multi-step differentiation protocols in a single living composite manner in a temporal controlled manner. <coughs> and that's basically what we show here. So we, this works quite nicely. So far, I've been talking about leveraging this tireman for cross-linking, for mechanics. But in the second slide that I showed you, there's also the, bio uh, the biochemical stimulus. So we also wanted to have spatiotemporal control over what the cell is presented with in terms of peptides, growth factors, exosomes, etc. So we also would like to have biochemical temporal control. Now, we leverage something that is very well known by most of you, an ELISA assay. So you use a biotin for complexation. It's multivalent, so you actually amplify your signal because it has multiple binding sites. And then we play the trick. If you go to old literature, it will tell you why um, Evidon and biotin are selected. And that's because it's a freakishly strong non-covalent bond. Up until two years ago, it was the strongest non-covalent bond known to man. So that means if you want to do an assay without any loss of signal, amazing. Hence, it's in your ELISA uh, kits. But there's also a whole host of analogs that bind weaker and weaker and weaker. So we use those uh, analogs, and then in this case, you can, for example, just have a biotin that you have a neutravidin or an analog, like an, uh, uh, a neutravidin or anything of that type of sort. Then you can come in with, a, for example, a destyle biotin. Now, we have at this moment a macromolecular complex with a bond that is weaker than the conventional biotin. So that means that we can now also do supermolecular displacement. So now we can start kicking out the weaker bonding elements. So we can come in with a binder, for example, the destyle biotin. This is a VHH nanobody where we can scavenge uh, uh, or neutral, uh, neutralize or present uh, antigens of choice. And in this case, it's BP7. And then basically we can capture them. And if we no longer need it, we can get rid of it. Using SPR, we demonstrated that this, in, in this system indeed works nicely. Now, what do we use it for? Well, first of all, pretty pictures. So if these are microgels that you can't see. If we then add the, the destyle biotin with a green fluorophore, ah, there are my beads. But then if we add the biotin, then quite quickly, we completely change what happens. So that now means we have an on and off switch, or an on, an off, an on, and a differently on 
switch in our biomaterials. So, for example, now this is a hydrogel that we made with cells in it, and we used a genetically modified reporter assay for BMPs. So, if we put the cell in the gel without any stimulation, nothing happens. If you give stimulation in terms of BMP, obviously you would get a BMP signal because the cells are the reporter for it. The nice thing is then, if you add the destiobiotin that scavenges and neutralizes in this case the BMP, signal <coughs> goes away. If we then come in with the biotin, we can kick out the destiobiotin with the scavenger. So now the uh, biotin becomes readily available again, and etc. 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 So now we have something that you can have a cell in a gel in an environment, but we can specifically blind that cell to that environment for a specific molecule of choice. So obviously we took BMP7 because we would like to present it. Unfortunately it was a neutralizing one, but at this moment we're doing exactly the same for, for example, inflammasomes, where you can implant a living tissue in a uh, heavily inflamed area, where the cell typically is simply non-sensitive or it cannot see your inflammation. And then once it's done we can kick it out and you have a normal gel left. So we now have a single cell microgel that we use microfluidics. We did a lot of effort, which I just summarized in about one slide, where we can also put this single cell microgel in a second polymer. This is a stable emulsion, which means that now we have a, if you would like this for printing, we have an uncoupled microenvironment because the uh, microgels determine what the cell sees versus the second polymer, which you can use for anything and everything, whether it is stiffness, good for uh, additive manufacturing, degradability, vascularization, you mentioned it, we're doing it. Uh, we're basically, it's a working horse in the lab, we play around with this a lot. But we uncouple the micro and the macro environment. So in other words, what the cell sees and how the tissue at the macro scale behaves is now different. If you say, can you do it with a technology? The answer is if you use a cell, you can use this technology. Which means now we have a very nice toolbox. But as it says, we would like to use this to actually engineer some organs. And this is always how we present it. So we have a human with a very nice hydrogel. Now it's no longer, model now it's no longer homogenous, it's modular. Congratulations to us. And we typically use animals and uh, in vitro uh, assays to quantify it. But this is the reality. You need a microscope to see what we're actually producing. This has nothing to do with actually trying to treat humans. This is the way before steps, where you understand the fundament, you get uh, to understand the rules of the game, you can develop some uh, living matter, but none of this comes anywhere close to treating a human. It's way too small. And scaling is a real problem, because we can make small implants to, for example, treat rodents, like mice, but if you scale it up to human size, and again, scaling up into the third dimension is a real big volume game, it doesn't scale linear, it scales to the power of three, then for example, you can't have them survive. These are metabolically active and demanding tissues. If it's very small, yeah, you can go a couple of micrometers, survive till vascularization occurs. But if it actually becomes human-sized, what you'll inevitably get is a necrotic core. It simply undergoes an oxygen-induced uh, cell death. That's one of the reasons why we're not actually getting anywhere close to clinics. We can't scale it up without killing it. So we tried a couple of things that I'll run you through now. So first of all, um, you can do blood vessel engineering, but that's not always uh, convenient. For example, for cartilage there, you should not have in articular cartilage any blood vessels, but you want it thick enough so you actually get your nutrients in there, etc., etc. So what we did is we make monolithic uh, structures where we're using embedded bioprintings to uh, print in these kind of structures for strong strands of one polymer into a buff of another one. And then the, what we uh, then did is you can either make these kind of linear lines, you can make patterns, you can make interfacing, so there's communication between the lines. And what we actually did is we made it very diffusible matter into a normal matter where you have very slow diffusion. So in this case, what we create is our highways of diffusion. So if you put this in, this almost acts like a sponge that growth factors, nutrients, and et cetera, is really drawn in extremely rapidly. As you can see here, using, for example, FITC. So these highways of vascularization are useful for some application where you don't want directly an, uh, an, an interface with uh, blood vessels. Um, for example, in this case, we said we abstractly em uh, emulate cartilage because this is a soft area with cells in it in a hard domain, 
which in the abstract sense emulates the cartilage. And then indeed we show even if you would emulate these mechanical properties with these diffusive properties, you get way better cartilage being produced. So it's not only for diffusion, it's also for functional performance. On the other hand, most tissues do need blood vessels, so I should probably put a schematic of a blood vessel on here. But one of the ch uh, challenges that you have if you want to print a blood vessel is that the nozzle that you're printing with dictates the strand thickness that you can get. In other words, the diameter of your blood vessel is limited to the inside of the core of the needle you're using. And those are pretty big, those are hundreds of micrometers, even if you take the uh, smallest ones. Now, if you then use a bigger nozzle, you get a bigger strand, and, but then you still need to make it hollow. So what we did here is we realized that if you do embedded bioprinting, you can do two things currently in literature. You can use a liquid like solid, for example, a ball bath, like uh, the Angelini's work or Burdick's work, and then you can draw a line through it, a liquid like solid, so stress uh, relaxing. Or you can take a high viscous, so at the moment you print it, it stays in place. Now, liquid also has a sumport, and I'm going to use this word wrongly, but ductility depending on viscosity, which means that if you actually use low viscous elements, you can do strand thinning. And you know how that works between high and low viscosity, because for example, if you put uh, honey in tea and you start stirring it, you know you get strands, right? Way thinner than what you put in. So, in this case, we wanted to do that. We are putting water in low viscous water. You also know what that means. If you have two cups of tea, you just pour one in the other. It's not stable. So we're using an aqueous two-phase system, and that means as much as you have enough of polymer A and enough of polymer B, you can stabilize it. So you can have low viscous uh, liquids and literally separate them. In this case, for example, for dextrum and PEC, which is the best uh, uh, explained uh, system uh, for food and pharma, it's very common there. In uh, bioengineering, it's hardly used. Then basically, if you go, for example, over 6% of DEXDA, which we typically use is actually 10, but if you go over 6%, you only need 4% of PEC. So this is really in the region that we typically use in the lab. So, so if you go over it, you get a very stable system. We map that for many, many different materials to show what materials you can use this with in reality. And then, for example, if you would normally print in a non-HPS system, you see you can print it and directly diffusion because this is not stable. But if you print with an ATPS, you can print a liquid line in a liquid line, low viscous, and it stays nicely stable. To put it in order of magnitude, this is a log 10. This is what literature does. That's where we are able to go. So this is about two times more viscous than water. These are hardly printable. If you go to literature, it's about one pass per second that you use. That's really high viscous. Now, that's important because if you have these high viscous systems, then indeed, if you have your nozzle diameter versus your strand diameter, you see that's a very nice linear line. You get what you print. But now, if you use a very thick nozzle and you print, you can get very thin strands. And in fact, that also matters because now we can not only print with bigger nozzles or smaller nozzles, we can also change the print speeds because viscosity also kills cells. Printing cells at high viscosity at high speeds is viscous shear. You will kill your cells. So that's typically also a reason why we have very low print speeds in these papers that are beautiful, but they can't scale it up because you kill your cells. If you do this at low viscosities, you can print meters a second, stable, no cell death. Then you can start looking at what the advantages are. For example, if you have a granular bath and you want to print a blood vessel in it, they will always tell you it's a very nice blood vessel. This is a confocal image of what that blood vessel actually looks like if you use an embedded granular print bath. Yes, it's a tube. Yes, you can make this a hollow tube. No, this is not anything you want your blood vessel to look like. Since this is liquid in liquid, surface tension actually smooths it out, so you get very nice high definition prints. Also, you can print any material, multi-material, cross sections. You can go straight through the lines if you want to. So you can make in networks because uh, only at the moment you cross-link, it becomes a solid, so you can make very nice inter interconnected networks. And also, more importantly, this is printed in one go. So these are very thick strands that in one go we make very tiny capillaries going from A to B. So instead of having to change your nozzles, changing your ink, etc., we can just change the uh, speed by which your nozzle moves, and now we can change the diameter in real time, ad hoc. So 
We have now two uh, perfusion lines with a couple of very thin connectors like uh, capillary in between the blood vessels. We can go from very thick, this is about 20 cells wide, to all the way. This is a single cell train, so the diameter of the print here, and this is done with a 200 micrometer nozzle, all your cells are in a line. So we can also start patterning cells in 3D using very big nozzles at very high speeds. <coughs> it's very stable, very robust. Like I said, you can do with a drive-through motion. This is now all interconnected and later on we can cross-link so you get stable interfaces with hollow structures. If you want, if you don't want to deform, we know that it's only dependent on the drag angle, not the printing speed. So you can print something nice and then just yank it back through in the same way you came and then you get very nice straight structures. So in this case, we made a very complex vascular network in a very easy manner. This can be a visualization that you can make it hollow. You can have very complex bifurcating structures, which with te current technology you could not make these difficult bifurcating structures. And you can perfuse them because they're uh, quite uh, mechanically strong. You can squeeze them. You can make all sorts of difference. Uh, so you can make, uh, for example, uh, 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 widening structures that <coughs> look like embolisms. You can make nice bifurcations. In this case, what you see here are labeled red blood cells where this is tissue and these, all these different strands are different uh, uh, blood vessels. So we can now start to make really intricate blood vessel networks in a very simple way because we are no longer depending on the patterning. We can just simply draw what we like, then crosslink. Also again with the same trick, using the Tyreman crosslinking, we also, what I showed you before, this is the efficiency of the cells binding to a solid or a cell. Um, in if you already had crosslinked it, so what we were doing before. Now, if you work with a fully liquid system, what I just showed you before by the uh, mechanical transduction pathways, you can get about 24 more times efficiency if you work with a liquid system uh, like we demonstrate here. So also for the patterning, for example, of collagens on your surface, this is a very high efficiency system. We can get ourselves just to stick to our materials using this tyrosine tyros chemistry they will stay round because after we are done cross-linking, they just sit on there. But you can also then in one step also put uh, collagen in there and then the collagen actually is ni very nicely patterned on top of your blood vessel and that means that your cells will start stretching over the whole thing. So you can also uh, control what the morphology of your cells in while printing in a single step. Now, now we have bl blood vessels. It should be solved, right? Now, put it in the body, what happens? takes a while before it's vascularized, or more specifically, if we even have a vascularized printed system, it needs to be ana anastomosed. The blood vessels has to still be connected to the human body. Now that takes about three to seven days, depending on where you implant it. Here's my challenge for you. Hold your breath for five to seven days. See what happens. And the answer is, the same happens with your implant. It will not survive it. So we still need to have something to bridge this prevascular structure into an anastomose perfused structure. So we still need to make these cells survive for about a week. So we used to, we didn't invent that. That was uh, Cherry Stapler's lab for the use of calcium peroxides. If you put it in a watery phase, you get uh, oxygen and water out. You can put that in a polymer. Normally, if you put it under anoxia, meaning 0% oxygen, <coughs> then you get a lot of necrosis, a little bit of apoptosis and very few healthy cells. If you put your calcium peroxide, you'll still see some uh, way more healthy cells, no necrotic cells almost, but still a lot of apoptotic cells. And the reason why is you still produce hydrogen peroxide as an intermediary, which basically you go from the rain into the drip. First you kill it with no oxygen, now you start to kill it with uh, hydrogen peroxide. Not quite great. So we wanted to control the, re uh, the reaction kinetics because I don't know if you ever put peroxide in water. It's the thing that they uh, sometimes do in your high school and then it starts fizzing and bubbling. This is highly reactive. So we wanted to slow down this reaction. And this is a hydrolysis reaction. So what do you do? You make sure there's less water there. You can use a hydrophobic material, in this case a micromaterial, which we use double emulsion or microfluidics to use it, depending on which manuscript you read. But basically it's hydrophobic. Water goes in. Water goes in inefficiently. So now we can control how much water goes in and see, is seen by the uh, peroxide. So we just show with, with FIPSAM that we have very nice incorporation homogeneously. And instead of 
very strong uh, or hydrogen peroxide and oxygen release in the non-encapsulated, we can now do very slow, very controlled, very long-term oxygen generation. This is cytocompatible to very high uh, concentrations of these uh, uh, that, uh, oxygen generators, hydrophobic oxygen generators, HOCs. So we can now put quite a lot of payload in there. And then we started to use this in a uh, more preclinical setting. In this case, uh, first better days and then animal model. What you typically see in the literature is that they measure VEGF production after like four to eight hours. What you then see is that if the less oxygen you have, the more VEGF you have. Completely correct. What they don't tell you is if you keep it there, it will simply die in anoxia, which means that the total amount of VEGF is actually not very high if you implant it. If you actually look at these uh, manuscripts, you also see that they say that you, they have a very intense uh, vascularization at the edge of your implants. That's actually your blood vessel growing in. And then if you do a 4D reconstruction, you see that it's growing back out because the VEGF is lower in your uh, implant than in your tissue outside once your cells start dying. So you, although you read in the manuscripts very often, well, wait and it will be better. No, wait and it will get worse. So in this case, we put our uh, fully anoxic plus these uh, oxygen generators. And what we do now is we don't want to reestablish normoxia. We want to give it very low amounts of oxygen to barely survive. So it's nicely stressed out. I don't want these cells to be happy. I want them to be stressed. And that means that they're creating insane levels of VEGF continuously and progressively more because these cells survive and they're adapting metabolically. So if you would normally go to uh, a relatively large construct and if you implant it, then basically it looks like this. That's what the necrotic tissue looks like. This is a dead tissue uh, after seven days of implantation. If we now use oxygen generation, you can already see very nice vascularity. If you cut it through the middle, you can already see with live dead. This is the hydrogel, this is the uh, tissue from the host. It's dead if you use a conventional system. If you use the hydrogen, uh, the HOX, then you can already see these blood vessels really grow in nicely. And then not only do the vessels grow in, your hydrogel gets uh, uh, degraded. In this case, this was not dextrin, I have to say. This was a, a gelatin-based, gelma. So the cells actually degrade actively this material. Your cells are alive, they're metabolically active, they will degrade it. Also, that allows your blood vessels to go in, and now we have quite large perfused blood vessels. And also, you can't see it, I think, on, uh, with this projector. One of the arguments that you typically have is that your cells don't survive very nicely. If you implant them, your human cells get killed. What we now see is if you use a human nuclear antigen, now you see a very large amount of human cells still being alive while it's fully perfused and also infiltrated with animal cells. So, not all cells are killed by your immune system. They're also in, uh, kept alive, or uh, in this case, in conventional systems, are killed due to starvation and lack of oxygen. So we knew that that's important. I don't want to run you through this slide, but uh, at the time I was still a PhD <coughs> student uh, and uh, Jan was already a professor. We published something that we knew that oxygen tension not only was important for cell survival, but also for cell fate dis uh, uh, commitment. So in this case, we had uh, bone marrow MSCs where we differentiate them under anoxia or hy severe hypoxia and normoxia. And we demonstrated that you would get a specific type of cartilage, either uh, permanent articular cartilage, that stays and is insensitive to turning into bone, or you get hypertrophic cartilage that turns into bone if you implant it. Now, that's exactly what we showed. So if you precondition your cells using hypoxia, you get lots of cartilage, you don't get calcification in vivo and also no blood vessel formation. Well, if you do a, a normal condition under normoxia, the 21%, nowhere in your body it exists, but it's everywhere in your incubator, then basically you get uh, cartilage, but it's destroyed, or the cartilage matrix is uh, getting destroyed. You get lots of calcification and angiogenesis on, upon implantation. So we knew that it was also important for controlling your um, cell function, not just survival. So this one was submitted, and I still need to trim this to make it, so I apologize for the busyness of the slide. But the only thing that I want to uh, tell is, so now we implanted these uh, oxygen generating micromaterials inside of an animal, and we did that again in that gelma, and we now give a osteoinductive nanoparticle in there, so we would know it would go into the bonus uh, domain. We would have a fate commitment. We would put our just the gelma with these oxygen generating materials, or we put them both. Now, 
we would see the same. So all these bars, please don't read them, but this just means, again, material breaks down faster. And again, if you use oxygen <coughs> generation, you get more uh, vessels, and these vessels have a bigger diameter. So great, and it's a repetition of what I just said. But more importantly, if you start looking at like osteopontin and osteocalcin, which are osteogenic marker uh, genes and proteins, then only with controlling the oxygen, with 0% of the uh, uh, osteoinductive nanoparticles, we would start seeing bone formation. That was very surprising, because we were expecting that that one would be blank. In fact, if you add a little bit of uh, silicate nanoparticles, it works, and in certain conditions, giving an oxygen generating works even better. Where it really works super nicely, which you can see here, is if you go to, for example, uh, anoxia. If you look at the production of osteopontin and uh, osteocalcin, then only in truly anoxic environments, which is what you actually implant your tissue into, then you need your oxygen and your osteoinductive to get your uh, bone production in situ, in vivo. Now, we can also show that with calcification in vitro. We did the same trick for the heart, so we thought, well, if it works for bone, let's do it for heart too. Let's, keep, uh, uh, let's make a myocardial infarct in a mice, then give a gelatin, we give the, uh, the oxygen-generating micromaterials, we give SDF, which is a growth factor that recruits uh, cells into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the heart. It's a chemotactic growth factor, so it helps with regeneration. People want to go to clinical trials with it, uh, so it's pretty advanced. And then basically what we show is that only if you give uh, the cell, uh, the, the mouse, a myocardial infarction and give the cell with the oxygen-generating micromaterials, you already see that here this is fully sclerotic, this is fibrotic. If you only give the gel, well, you see something happening, but not much. If you give the oxygen generating, you actually can combat the damage done by um, uh, the myocardial infarctions. This is just a very large thing to show. We can also do uh, echocardiographs of that. So we have all the volume fractions, which is three pages of just bars going up and down. But we know that uh, basically, uh, if you can read these graphs, if you use your uh, oxygen generating uh, materials, you can already also have very nice uh, clinical measurable outcomes. Your volume fraction that you eject is higher if you use this type of treatment, at least in mice. If you then do ECGs, you can imagine this doesn't look like a happy mouse. This is basically a uh, ventricle fibrillation. It really is when the heart goes haywire and it doesn't know what it's doing. And it's beating as fast as it can go. There's no pacing anymore uh, in the uh, controlled sense. If you add the gel with the oxygen uh, generating particles, you see now something that you can see that it also starts to behave natural. So it's, you can see the, the, the QPR peaks as you had probably in the bachelor master. And then if we combine it with that growth factor, you see a very nice stable pattern that we cannot discriminate for normal mice, even though we gave them a myocardial infact, uh, infarction. And yes, the SDF works too, but you can also see that it still has these very weird peaks. So it basically has still fibrillation activity. The combination, we can't find it. Okay, so last part of the presentation. Uh, I talk already about the upscaling. I talk about keeping it alive, but now we still need to make it. So single cells, amazing. Some of you are uh, also doing it. What we never tell you is the speed by which we're doing it. It's very, very slow. It's about a microliter a minute. Try to fill a cubic centimeter with that or bigger. Good luck. Um, so we're really investigating uh, methods to scale this up in a controllable setting so it can actually start making an impact. The first attempt that we did was uh, a serial lithography, so we start to amplify these, so it's click and play. We also did multiplexing, so you can have an infinite amount of stacks and we divided uh, flow dividers. So you now you can have, n and we did three, but you can do 50 as well, or 100, etc. But you can also now do it in 3D. So now you have one inlet, one outlet, and now you can have 15, 150, 1500 droplet generators. And you can just print this in an indefinite scale, only being defined by how big your print platform is. On the other hand, we are also using, again, uh, microfluidics, a little bit a newer technology. If you're interested, let me know. But for now, I'll skip the technology behind it. The important thing here is that basically we have a continuous jet with an intermittent jet looks like this, so now we can get very fast droplets, 
looks very slow, but this is ultra uh, slow motion capture. So we're creating insane amounts of uh, uh, throughput. So if you have a very fast optimized platform for production, that's what you get. Now with a non-optimized, this was our very first test, we are already 300 times faster than uh, my conventional microfluidic systems. So now we really can start scaling up. So now we're not mi making microliters, but we're making milliliters a minute. But we have the same resolution, we have the same control. We then uh, thought if we're making these particles, we can also put them together. And we can click them together because I can do a post cure as I showed you, but I can also do that to beat, not just make my beads stronger, but also to bind my beads together. So that's what you see here. So a, a nano CT of these beads being put together. And the thing that I would like to show you here specifically, if, if you look carefully, you can always look in and sometimes even look through. And that's because if you put, for example, marbles in a jar, you will always have an open interconnected network. And the nice thing about this is these are very small microgels, which means we're also making a high density of small capillaries. So what you're looking at here are the beads, the microgels being clicked together with confocal imaging. And these are fluorescent microparticles in a cubic centimeter tissue being perfused. So we have a cubic centimeter of tissue and the maximal diffusive length that we have is 20 micrometers in this case. The amount of uh, capillaries that you have is extremely high, that's why we never make them. We are very good at printing blood vessels, big vessels coming in, delivering it, but nutrients, etc., are given by capillary network, which means as much as how much do you need? Well, an average cubic centimeter has about 14 kilometers length of capillary, so try to print that, it's not possible. By clicking them together, we can get a very nice net connecting network. And again, so this is the middle of a uh, cubic centimeter and wherever you are, and this is real time, so uh, even slow down a little bit, you can see that the fluorescent molecules that we uh, now uh, go through, and this is the size of a growth factor, it goes through, it perfuses all of your microgels simultane near simultaneously, and it also exits it. So that means that in a cubic centimeter, now we have immediate access to the entire volume. So now we can actually start to stimulate that. This looks very nice. The interesting thing here is that if you do this nano CT analysis, we know what this network looks like, and we are below the theoretical limit because these so gels are soft, so they are compacting. The nice thing is because they compact, they all become, uh, regardless of size, inside of the uh, capillary network domain. So whatever you do, you get capillaries, take big particles, you get capillary sized networks, take small particles, you get it as well. So nature plays a nice trick there for us. And then if you look at what are the shear forces, this is a nano CT with a flow stress analysis for, the, for a capillary network of a mouse. And this is what we have, and these forces are near identical. So not only do we get a high density of capillaries, they also provide the same amount out of shear stress that you normally have in your capillary. Last few slides and then I'll wrap up. You can not only do that with two jets but also three jets. In this case, in the middle one, we put a polymer, we do an ionic crosslink inside out, which means that we get very nice hollow. Again, we are much faster. What you now can do is now you cannot make these particles in high throughput, but you can start making organoids in high throughput. So now we're making about 100,000 organoids per second if you want to. It's really fast, but that also means we can also go to Novartis and ask for their library to screen. Not possible under any condition uh, in the rest of literature. But the nice thing is if we put a few cells, and these are, uh, we use IPSCs and or uh, ESCs, so pluripotent cells, you can put them together, you have a few cells and they really develop nicely into very monodispersed cavitated structures. And then if you look at the 3D of it, then yes, they are all nicely alive with a empty core. So this is not necrosis, this is self-assembly, self-organization. And also you have, see here the nucleus is very nicely polarized. So these are really becoming organoid-like structures by themselves. And I would like to add, this is in the absence of any growth factors being added. This is proliferation medium. And they do that with 100% efficiency for all that we produce. And they maintain uh, pluripotent. Yes, you can also differentiate them, they're functional. So if you look at two, uh, uh, if you take a genetic uh, 
report a cell line for uh, myocardiogenesis, MESP or uh, NCX 2.5, then they become positive. If you have them in culture, I still think this is very cool because I didn't work in the cardiology field, but now you have beating cardioids. And this is one, but this is one of 10,000 per, uh, one per 100,000 per second. So we now have something really to screen. Yes, you can do high uh, level imaging on it because these are in very thin shelled microgels. So you can use confocal uh, imaging in 3D in a manipulable uh, microgel to use high definition imaging, including uh, contraction mapping, which is important for drug screening. And the last slide, yes, we can do that for cardioid. We can also make this uh, immunoprotective using, for example, PEX instead of alginates. And then we can create islands of Langerhans, which are insulin sensitive. And then we also implanted that in mice. And then in this case, we're not making organoids, we're making islands of Langerhans. And once you implant them in diabetic mice, you can restore normal glycemia. But for the first time in an FDA EMA compliant manner and a scalable throughput. So that's about it that I would like to talk with you about. I talked a little bit about the microfluidics and some work that we do on the, on the bio-inks. A little bit as a uh, primer, I couldn't help myself but talk about the work that we're now really focusing on, quite some of the organoid production. I haven't talked about cellular nanocoatings. If you have an interest in that, do talk to me later. Organs on chips I also largely skipped. And I talked a little bit about the 3D bioprinting, which we're gearing up towards light-based and as well as some uh, metabolism uh, sustaining micromaterials. So I didn't do this work, except the slide from the, <laughs> from the work of uh, the PhD. Uh, so I have the fortune to have a fantastic team of postdocs who also helped me with the supervision of the amazing PhD candidates. Um, I like to fund the funders because no money is no experiments, unfortunately. So with that, uh, I would like to also thank you for your attention and uh, Jan also for inviting me.